Hello. Hi. Oh, you, you, wow, that's the first time that's actually worked. Okay, good. Welcome. This, this talk is called Failure is Not an Option. Um, my name is Paris Buffalo Addison, uh, and we're going to be talking about mistakes. Uh, mistakes are fun, but not when you make them. Uh, there's three main things I want to cover. Basically, what is a mistake? Uh, how do they happen? And how can we help the user avoid them? Uh, these are very, very important questions as you'll come to learn. Uh, and hopefully you'll believe me. So I'm going to tell you why you should believe me before we actually start talking about the interesting content. A lot of you actually do know. So large chunks of that column and a few over here. But most of you probably don't know me. Uh, I'm from Hobart, which doesn't normally look that pretty. Uh, but I also live most of the time in San Francisco, which is surprisingly similar to Hobart in many ways. I am the co-founder of Secret Lab. <laughs> Not meant to say that. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Secret Lab, which is an iPhone, iPad, and whatever takes our fancy development studio. Uh, we're based in Hobart, although, as I said, we tend to be in San Francisco most of the time. I wear many hats, so I also do a lot of work with Mebo, which is a Silicon Valley startup and one of the largest things on the internet. I'm also a PhD student from UTAS, which is my justification from being here. Uh, or at least I'm still pretending to be a PhD student at UTAS. I've written a lot of apps, uh, or helped write a lot of apps, or told people to write a lot of apps, some of which are here. Yes? Pretty quick question, Paris. What's your PhD topic? Uh, information management and how people handle it in offices with like paper-based information. So I could go on, but that would just <laughs> disrupt, disrupt the whole thing. Uh, so we've done a lot of apps. So this kind of justifies why I can talk about apps. We also write games. This talk isn't about games, but John, uh, my co-founder of Secret Lab, is doing a great talk about game development tomorrow. You should all go to that. It's good fun. This is about Canadian superheroes. It'll be awesome. I'm also an author. This is yet another hat, in addition to the real hat I wear. This is about to come out, literally. And there's another one uh, about the 3D game engine, Unity, which doesn't yet have a cover. So I made one. <laughs> uh, that's coming next year. So. Basically, this is my justification for making everything up. Everything I'm about to say, I just made up, really. There's, there's no justification for any of this. Uh, this talk is on all the interesting platforms. So I'm not in the big room because I'm not iOS, but we're in here. It covers everything. So yeah, let's go on. Your apps should be a lot of things. But in relation to this talk, they should specifically be intuitive, discoverable, guessable, attractive, and you have to pick all four. And Apple likes to hammer this in a lot for the iPhone. They used to like to hammer it in for the Mac, but they don't so much anymore, which kind of sucks. Uh, your app really should be all these things. And we know that. Like Everyone who develops these things sort of knows that to begin with. And there's one thing we forget, and I'm going to get to that. This talk is basically about principles to guide us. As I said, I made it all up, so it's not really any rules or hard and fast. Right? I don't actually know what I'm talking about. This just seems to work. Uh, the biggest thing I want to just point out is that no design rule is actually always true. Uh, there's only one rule that's actually always true, and that is there are always exceptions. So remember that. And when we're designing software, we have to remember we can't always completely eliminate error. Uh, there's no magical way to do that, which is kind of sad. Uh, but we should try. Uh, so my talk is about preventing mistakes through preventing errors. Mistakes are made by the user. OK? So the person who's using your software makes mistakes. And we want to stop that. This is a dictionary definition of a mistake. Please read it. It's a noun. Uh, it's basically the user taking an action and then deciding for whatever reason that it was wrong. Because something happened, or they changed their mind, or the whole thing was wrong to begin with. It's an action, then a decision. So even with the most intuitive application, you haven't necessarily removed the potential for mistakes. And you should be doing that. Uh, mistakes don't disappear because of the other qualities of your application, and those were those four qualities. So if you've hit all them, you've probably still got mistakes. And this is the fifth thing that you need to remember, removing mistakes and making failure not an option anymore. Uh, so why do users actually make mistakes? There's quite a few reasons. Uh, and we need to understand them so we can design around those errors. Uh, it might be the important, most important question you actually ask yourself when you're developing apps. There's three reasons why users make errors. Three fundamental reasons that mistakes occur. They're misunderstandings, accidents, and regret. 
They're all quite interesting, and we're going to go through them one by one. You might be thinking at this point, users are stupid. Probably, probably true in a lot of occasions, but I don't want you to think that. They're mostly very intelligent people like yourselves. So they're, in fact, users are not stupid. And that's important to remember uh, all the time when you design your app. Uh, sadly, myself included, we often approach building our apps with the feeling that users are really stupid people. And they need to be punished for things they've done wrong. This is, this is not the case. Basically, if an error happens in your app, it's always our fault. And by our fault, I mean the developer. And if it's our fault, we have to fix it. Sometimes it's their fault. In that case, it's still ours. So you're probably now quite confused. And that's what I'm hoping you are. Good. Good. OK. Next, next thing, misunderstandings. Uh, users look at your software. And based on what they see or how they're feeling, uh, they make assumptions. Uh, they go, I thought this did something, and it turned out not to do. Oh, no, what's going on? Uh, they think it works one way, and it doesn't, or it does, as the case may be. Uh, and if the assumption, assumption is wrong at any point, then that's a misunderstanding. Uh, it's also a mistake. It's also a failure. Uh, likewise, generalizations. When the uh, user is coming in with some previous knowledge or experience, they look at this, they go, ah, oh, this is how the app works on another system, so it should work this way here, right? And no, they don't. This consistency, inconsistency. It's important to remember. They generalize from what they know, uh, and your app turns out to behave differently. That's a mistake. And the, the final type, uh, the second type of mistake is accidents. So physical slips uh, or brain malfunctions. So physical slip is like we trigger a menu, we slide over to a pop-up, and we hit the wrong thing. Uh, physical slips are when there's an actual physical malfunction as far as triggering something in your app. They click a button, it's beside another button, doesn't happen. Uh, and of course, people just go play nuts as well. Uh, users' brain is on the fritz. They don't know what they click. They click all the buttons, mash the keyboard, run around, throw the iPhone at the wall, whatever. Uh, you'll often see support queries about this one if you run any sort of support. People click the wrong thing all the time, which destroys their work or does something they didn't want to their work. This is still probably your fault. Third kind of mistake is regret. Uh, it's the most difficult one to deal with in software because software behaved as design, basically and then the user did something wrong they didn't want to do, and they decided it's your fault, which it is. Uh, they changed their mind, they just decided they want to go back, and you can't go back unless you've got undo, and we'll talk about that later. There are entire applications designed about regret, like Photoshop. You can just keep going back and forward between what you're doing. That's a good, that's a regret-based workflow, it's a good thing. It's about the only thing Photoshop does particularly well. When we look at these mistakes, who's actually to blame? Now, I've sort of been hinting that it's us, uh, which is good. And we're seeing a drift away from actually blaming the users, and that's also great. And I just want to reinforce that it's always our fault, uh, even when it's theirs, if they can't actually reverse it. And there's a sort of genius Mac developer in the Mac development community that I'm hoping a lot of you are familiar with. And a lot of this is sort of based on stuff he's done, uh, called Matt Legend Gemmel. Has anyone heard of him? Good. This is a table he uses in a lot of his presentations, and it's a particularly effective way of presenting this sort of stuff. This is a list of all the types of user error we just talked about. Uh, so we've got assumptions. This is where the user looks at your application and decides using some secret magical thought process in their head that they know what it's going to do, and it doesn't. So that happens in the user's brain. It can't possibly be our fault, right? No, that's not the case. It actually is still our fault, so we're going to put a tick there. Uh, and then there's generalizations. This has even less to do with us, probably. Like, the user sees something elsewhere. They assume it applies to your app as well. It's not even with your software, so it's definitely their fault. Again, no, it's not their fault. It's our fault still. Uh, random experiences they've had lead them to use how they use your software, and we should be aware of that. So again, our fault. You can see where this is going. Uh, physical slips, again, user slips off a button, hits something. Again, this can't possibly be our fault. The user's hand-eye coordination cannot be controlled. Well, no, but we can reasonably expect that because they're human, they're potentially going to hit the wrong thing. Uh, so again, we have to put a tick there for us. And then brain slips, you know, we have no influence. People are really, really stupid. Uh, the app functions as expected. They just decide they didn't want to do that. And ditto for regret. But again, I'm going to put six there with a little asterisk because if the user can't reverse the damage, then it's our fault. And that goes back to undo. And, and again, I'm hoping at this point you're somewhat surprised and or confused like this guy. This is the best picture ever. I've been wanting to use this for ages. Um, and hopefully you're thinking, this is kind of depressing. It's not my fault if the user's too damn stupid to click the right button. 
uh, we'll trigger a function, good faith, and then decide they don't want it anymore. But no, it's, it's your fault. Trust me. It's your fault. And the user will see it this way as well. So if they don't see it this way, then they probably don't have sufficient self-respect to see it that way. And then you should see it that way anyway. So you should always be seeing it this way. You should start off in this position and think, what can you do to prevent any of these things? Uh, at least a great software that way. So this is another concept that quite a few developers in the Mac community talk about a lot. Uh, software chain of command. It starts with you as the captain. You create this fabulous piece of software. Uh, you're in control, it's yours, you know how it works. Then the user comes along and the user is more powerful than you. It's, the user makes your captaincy absolutely mean nothing. It's, the user, it's uh, not the user's responsibility uh, to accept any of your assumptions about how the software should work. And it's not the user's responsibility to adapt to the shortcomings uh, of your software or agree with any of your interpretations. The user is actually the boss here, and it's our fault. So we need to make sure uh, nothing bad can actually happen. That said, some people really are beyond help. Um, most often we're still guilty, but there's always that really stupid user that comes along and says something stupid like, when I click increase font, my font gets bigger, and complains constantly about it. Uh, don't beat yourself up over the tiny percentage of users like that. Uh, most often we are actually guilty either because we create the situation or because we don't allow the situation to be uncreated. And the latter is the more common. So why does this happen? It's all about attitudes and conventions. They all allow mistakes to happen. Uh, people in software development have a certain set of assumptions. Some of them are quite understandable, but they often lead to thinking like this. So the perception of the problem is that because mistakes happen in the user land, that we can't do anything about it, and that's completely wrong, and we need to remember that. There's a little law called Murphy's Law, which I've resourced, uh, researched at this scholastic source. Um, in summary, it basically says this. This is my experience in general, but it applies to software. Uh, there's a really good clue here as to what's going on. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, so if we can make things not possible to go wrong, then we solve it, surely. And this is where failure is not an option comes from. So if failure is not an option, and if it is, remove the consequences. That seems pretty simple. Mistakes happen because we do not prevent them. And that's pretty simple. We can do better. So let's take a look at some examples uh, and, and go through a few things that I think are software failures. And hopefully you'll, you'll get an understanding of how we can actually prevent that sort of thing. Does anyone know what this is? It's an iPhone. Uh, this is about ambiguity. So this is Safari on the iPhone. Everyone's used this many, many times. Uh, I've made lots of mistakes with this app, and maybe some of you too uh, have as well. I could just be stupid, but we'll see. How do you open a tab in Safari? You all know in this? Don't tell me, just good. OK. Try and approach this if you've not actually used Safari before, and you don't just know the answer. You may have come from the desktop, We've used desktop Safari, and you probably have the concept of tabs in your head. But it's not necessarily obvious how to open it if you've never used one before. There's this icon. It looks like a stack of windows of some description. It's a pretty strong candidate. Uh, it looks like a duplicate button, maybe. There's definitely something I might want to push if I wanted to make a new tab. But there's also this one. Uh, this is like the universal symbol for more things. Uh, and I might want to push that as well, because it's kind of interesting. So which one do I actually push? Well, we all know which one it actually is. Uh, but hey, it's not necessarily obvious. If we look at desktop Safari, then we can open a new tab with the plus button, which is like the universal symbol for new things there as well. Uh, so you think, ah, oh, obviously, new tab on the iPhone comes from the plus button, right? Easy. But no, if you've used Safari on the iPhone, then you know it's actually that button. And this is kind of ambiguous. Another example from Safari, which is just full of failures. Um, Bookmarks. How do you add a bookmark to Safari on the iPhone? There's this nice friendly button here uh, with, you know, looks like a book. This is a good chance your eye will instantly see this thing when you think bookmarks. Uh, at least if you come from a Mac, Windows, they're called favorites or something. But um, to me, this is bookmarks. But again, that, that little button's still hanging there. And that's the universal symbol for new things, isn't it? So we want to push that, maybe. And that's actually how you add a bookmark. You all know that as well. Uh, and this still surprises me. Often I push the wrong one. And lots of people seem to do the same thing. 
Uh, and once you learn that, it's okay. So you don't do it again most of the time. Um, but the question is, is it obvious? Uh, I don't think it is. So I think it actually invites mistakes because it's kind of sitting there, it's Im implying one thing and doing another, or there's multiple options to do the same sort of thing and they look like they should be both doing it. And the question I want to ask is, have mistakes been allowed to happen by not having a better design in the first place? And I think this is the case here. And I think it could definitely be better. Ambiguity forces your user to assume or generalize. So that's a big problem. So even if the user's assumptions are actually right or turn out to be right, then you'll force them to make a leap of faith in you and your software. And that's a really bad thing for you to be doing. You shouldn't do that. Why would you do that to them? These people are often paying you money or you're paying them sometimes. Uh, ambiguity is a big problem. If there's more than one candidate for something in your UI, you have a big problem. Can't hammer that home enough. It's, it's just confusing. There's just too much stuff to look at. And nobody wants to look at lots and lots of stuff. Uh, it's too much choice is overwhelming and encourages the users to fail because they click the wrong thing. And even if it's a small mistake, it's still a failure, in my opinion. And this is not limited to like theoretically uh, extremely polished consumer-facing apps. It happens in like developer tools where it still really shouldn't happen because developers are just a different type of consumer. So in Xcode, uh, I've gone through and added a whole bunch of buttons to the toolbar. But right there, there's three hammers of slightly different shades. There's two, two play buttons, two brooms, and a task button that looks like a stop sign. Um, imagine if you don't actually know what these do. It's kind of confusing. And just because this is an IDE for geeks, there's not really any excuse to make this ambiguous. Well, what the hell is going on here? I don't really know. If I turned off the buttons underneath, I'd probably forget it. The, the, the text underneath, I'd probably forget as well. Um, again, going back to the awesome Matt Legend Gamel, and Legend is actually his name. Uh, he summarizes this sort of thing well. And this is him presenting, so I couldn't be bothered making another slide of this because this was just too good. Uh, stuff you're meant to do is easy. Stuff you're not meant to do is hard, such as fighting sharks. Sharks have fins, you don't. Sharks are in their element, you're not. And sharks can smell your blood and so on. Uh, this is often forgotten in software development. Why do we forget the shark rule? Uh, stuff that is beneficial and encouraged to do is often just as easy to do as stuff that deletes all your work in software. And this is really, really stupid. Uh, don't let the destructive, dangerous, damaging stuff be just as easy to do as like creating a new tab or whatever. Um, we often have this false perception that usability and intuitiveness uh, should be presented as accessibility, uh, accessibly as possible. Uh, and that's true, but it often leads to making dangerous stuff really easy to do. And it's basically an anti-rule for usability. Do not make dangerous stuff easy to do. It's just stupid. And we're not that stupid because we make this beautiful software to begin with and then this, this happens. Let's take a look at some more examples. This is a great one. Uh, it's from TextEdit. It's a pretty good app. comes with macOS. It's based on NS document architecture. It's a standard sheet when you try and uh, save something. We've all seen this many times, I'm sure. Has anyone not seen this? Good. Yeah, good. OK. There was a guy shaking his head. I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, this is not random placement of stuff. Like, Apple has actually thought about this. And lots of other desktop environments like Windows and like some of the Linux GUI toolkits forget this as well. There's mistake prevention in this GUI, spacing particularly. So on the right hand side, we have the really safe, happy place. It's like got Batman, it's got a unicorn, it's got awesome stuff. Good things happen here. You're always welcome on this side. It's like save, my document is safe, it's cancelled, let's go back to my document, it's not going anywhere. On the other side, you have like the painful stuff where you've died, dysentery apparently. Um, nasty stuff happens on the other side. It's bad. Uh, in the middle, you've got like the neutral zone. If anyone gets that, I'll be very impressed. That's good. Um, well, not you, Frank. You don't count. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Anyway, in the middle is the safety margin. And that's between the good stuff and the bad stuff. And, and, and they're split out. So on one side, you've got the dysentery, and the other side, you've got the unicorns, Batman, dolphins, rainbows, things like that. And, th and this is a safety margin. Uh, and people often forget safety margins. It's, it's very important. Uh, thank you, Frank. <laughs> There's a really huge fail that is really pervasive in many UIs relating to safety margins. Does everyone recognize this? This configuration of buttons? This configuration of buttons is evil. Hate it. Please hate it. Uh, why, why, why do we always see this? Is it just because it's easy to do? It's, it's, I, don't, I don't know. 
Left is your friend. He's the happy unicorn with Batman and so on. He creates fantastic new things and brings happiness. Right is evil. It's misery. It deletes things from the world. Um, this leads directly to physical slips. This is everywhere. This is even in like apps that everyone perceives as awesome and beautifully designed, like Tweety on the left, where at the same time as trying to add a new account, you can actually delete your other Twitter accounts. And it's even in Apple's apps all the time. Uh, like mail, when I'm trying to add a new mail account, I can delete my other one. I've done this before. Again, I might just be stupid, but this is pretty bad. It's even in like developer tools, like Interface Builder, if I'm trying to remove plugins or add plugins, they're right next to each other. It's pretty stupid. Why let me nuke everything when I'm just looking to add something? Or even worse, just trying to look at a list? It's really stupid. Really, really stupid. So please, just say no to this. Make the destruction, destructive action hard to do. Um, why is there a fun greetings entering my address book? <laughs> I wonder what that is. Um. <laughs> Um, just say no to the minus button. And lots of apps don't actually use the minus button. Like address book is an absolute UI horror, but it doesn't use the minus button. Uh, iTunes is also a UI horror, but it doesn't use the minus button. So playlist you have to, have to delete in a different way. It's good, just, just say no. Uh, another really good example of this sort of UI fail uh, is this one. This is just a complete fail. Um, there's a huge amount of reasons. I could, I could spend like three hours just talking about why copy and paste is bad. Here's a summarized version, just so I don't. They're next to each other on the edit menu, which means you could accidentally hit the wrong one. They're next to each other on the keyboard, which means you could accidentally hit the wrong one. They're next to each other on toolbars, usually with similar icons, which means you could accidentally hit the wrong one. The same problem is repeated on the iPhone with a little pop-up you get when you try and copy and paste, so you could do the wrong one. And they're destructive. So copy and paste kind of advance around each other, deciding which one's going to destroy everything. Um, if you're pasting, copy destroys the clipboard. Uh, if you're copying, then you hit paste, then paste destroys the current selection. Uh, it's too late to fix this huge error, so please just don't make another copy and paste. Um, it's not like the minus button. The, the minus button being next to the plus button is kind of like a really obvious villain. It's got the, the black moustache, the black hat, like the layer. It's obvious it's going to do bad. But copy and paste, kind of, they're both friendly tools until one of them deletes everything else. Um, please don't let this happen. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> Make dangerous stuff difficult. And this is so easy, that so many, and so many people don't do it. It's really surprising. I don't, I don't know why this just happens. And that's, that's that. Next thing we're going to talk about is consistency. Uh, there's two types of consistency. There is consistency of experience, uh, where users generalize. They're like, oh, it works this way in Mail. It works this way in iTunes. It works this way in iCal. I'm assuming it's going to work this way in your app. And there's consistency of expectation, where uh, users look at what they're seeing, they figure out what they feel is going to work, and it works. Or it doesn't work. And that's actually not necessarily based on other applications. That's just users. First, we're going to look at consistency of experience. Um, this is where users says, I already know how this works. Every other app does it the same way. It's pretty common. It's a good thing. It's also called transferable knowledge. It's really good. Every app does this the same way. It means they're going to know how to use your app or most of your app instantly. And you can get a lot of this for free by reading Apple's human interface guidelines, um, which are at developer.apple.com. Please read them. They're not actually that brilliant because they're really inconsistent. But if you do implement the stuff that they say in a general sense, then you'll get like 50 to 75% of the way there in terms of actually making a good UI. Hide is a really good example for this. Photoshop takes over, hide, and makes it do something completely different. Uh, there's a good reason for this, in that Photoshop actually had uh, its, its own shortcut bound to Apple H, uh, Command H, long before it became a standard on Mac OS, and it's just sort of stuck. But if you push Apple H in Photoshop, it doesn't hide the app, which is what most people expect it to do. And that's a fail. That's not consistent. So think hard before you break consistency. Uh, it's really bad if you do. Next. Consistency of expectation. Uh, that's when the user thinks, I, I can guess how this works. And most of the time, they should be right. They think, this app just makes sense to me. And if they're right, then it's all good, and you haven't made a, a failure. It's composed of intuition, deduction, and assumption. And those three things sort of work together to make the user feel like they're actually at home. And when they feel like they're at home, they think, I am good with computers. And this is a good thing for you. 
That user actually knows how to use your app. And if they don't feel like they know how to use your app, and again, this is your fault when they don't, you're shaking the confidence of the user. Uh, you're shaking the confidence of the user in your app. Uh, you shake the confidence of the user in their ability to use your app. And worst of all, you actually shake their own personal confidence in their ability to use computers. And you might think that's kind of stupid, but that's actually what happens. So don't do it. Usually, uh, expectation actually beats experience. So the user will go with expectation over experience most of the time, and that's kind of interesting. And a particularly good example to look at that is the Finder. Who, who here used Mac OS before Mac OS X? Good. Okay, so you're going to know what I'm talking about. With, with, with the Finder, what are you actually doing? Does anyone want to tell me which one they think they're actually doing in Mac OS X? Browsing. Browsing? <laughs> So that's actually, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so what, 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 exactly. So the finder used to be spatial, which means you're actually viewing the files, or, or as close to the files as you get. Now, now it's not spatial anymore, except for the desktop, where it is actually spatial. Uh, so it's kind of confusing whether you're using Windows to look at a representation of the file system, or you're actually working with the files. Um, what it actually is, it's a document-based application just based on the standard NS document architecture that happens to look at lists of files. It's not spatial anymore. But then you get to the desktop and this thing's hanging there constantly. This is actually spatial. The files stay where you put them, which makes you think they're spatial and it's actually working. It makes you feel like you're interacting directly with something when you're probably not, but this actually behaves like a spatial file manager. Uh, again, who, who's ever pushed con uh, Command N in Finder and, and gotten one of these when they expected the other? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you, you look at it and you sort of think, because I'm working with a file manager, the first class object of this app is files or folders. So you want a new entity, i.e. folder. But you push Command N and you get the first class object of this app, which is actually a window. Uh, the main entity of Finder is a window. It knows that. It deceives you into thinking that's not what it actually is, though. Uh, the Finder thinks of itself as a window managing app. So Command N makes a window. It's quite logical. But that's a pretty big failure. Uh, command N equals making a new thing of the thing this app primarily, primarily deals with. And Finder thinks it deals with Windows. You think it deals with files and folders. So it violates consistency of expectation for some people. Um, so again, your consistency of expectation was broken. That's a big fail. This menu sucks. Next, alerts. Alerts do all sorts of fun things. They warn users of error conditions, and they allow confirmation of dangerous actions. They also inform users of task completion. No, they don't. That sucks. Um, alerts are awful. They just plain suck for a variety of reasons. This applies to iOS, the little blue pop-up, and macOS. Um, they're annoying, impotent, demeaning, counterproductive. I had a really great example emailed to me. It was shown to me earlier. I'll show you later if you want. I haven't had time to put it into the slide. It's another one to go with this collection. My time is your, more important than yours. Stop what you're doing and read this now. This is what apps kind of expect of you. This is the sort of alerts you get. Only one of these is actually real, but they all might as well say the same thing. So we've got the, the Word. Word has finished searching your document. We didn't find anything. OK, thanks for telling me Word. And then we've got like the, the fake ones, which stop what you're doing. You'll never believe what just happened. Seriously, this is intense. I couldn't find your file. Well, fancy that. These are all useless. What's the point? They just pop up and annoy you. Just basically saying, the app or the developer's time is more important than the user, so I'm going to pop up an alert that does absolutely nothing and just annoys you. It's annoying. Who's encountered this alert? Yeah, it's just, just, it's just frustrating? Yeah. What, what was the point of having the alert? So next we've got impotent alerts. This is from Dreamweaver. So it's just telling you it can't do anything, so we're resigned to failure. And then we've got the fake one, it's just, I can't do it. The thing you wanted, yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath on Let's never speak of this again. A thousand curses. It's, it's useless. Nothing's happening. It's impotent. They don't just piss you off. They actually fail to help you in this case. Um, the time point at which you could have been awesome is now gone, and now your app is just alcoholic in the corner. Next, we've got uh, demeaning alerts. This is from Illustrator. So in the case of Illustrator, and here it's actually assuming that it knows what I want to do when I've clicked a tool, and it's telling me to use a different tool to do what it is assuming I want to do. What, what's, why? Uh, this is the fake one, of course. See what I have to deal with. You obviously have no idea what you're doing. Be gone from my site and return to when, where, where you are worthy. So uh, pity my children. You know, it's, it's, many alerts are actually this one. 
Uh, it's basically just the system screaming, you're stupid, you're stupid, over and over again, and not actually trying to help you. Uh, so it's not only annoying, impotent, it's also demeaning as well. In, in my experience, there are really only two actual alerts. And they're these two. Is that a fair assessment? Yep. The first one means one very specific thing. That is, this app is rubbish. That's what the user thinks immediately when they see that sort of alert. And the second one means, I don't understand computers, so you've just shaken the user's confidence. And those are both really bad. You shouldn't be doing either of those things. Um, these alerts both suck, and these basically summarize all the other alerts. But I'm actually lying. There's only really one alert. It's this one. This is how the user sees it, no matter what the alert actually says. Alerts are a big emergency break. So if you're using them, you're basically telling the user that everything they've been doing is less important than seeing this alert. And to that end, they're an excuse. They allow you to believe you've offset uh, some bad behavior or offset a potential failure uh, by warning the user or by telling them that your app's too crap to actually handle it and you're done. But no, they're just training the user to fail. Um, uh, are you sure you want to move the following articles to the recycle bin? Um, no, no. When, thanks, Windows. Now I'm trying to ignore that alert. So any sort of useful alert, and that's the, potentially the one situation where an alert is actually useful, and if you're about to do something seriously destructive, we're now trying to ignore it because of things like the recycle bin. Uh, it's basically like closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. And by that I mean you finally figure out the horse has gone and shut the door after the horse has been shot somewhere else. Confirmation alerts make things worse, in my opinion. So, are you sure is just a weasel contract? It's just like, I warned you, you can't sue me now. You're asking the user to agree to rubbish that doesn't actually mean anything. You're saying, I have failed, you can't carry on until you, the user, say it's okay. Please click okay. Come on, I'm waiting for you, come on. You're making the user an accessory to crap. Uh, and it's not worth doing. Don't, don't confirm anything. Confirmation actually hides a really big, genuine problem, which is the lack of undo, usually. So you should implement pervasive undo uh, then nothing is dangerous and confirmation becomes irrelevant. There are some good alerts and you can mitigate the crapness of alerts by making good ones. There's a really good one in macOS. In iCal, if you actually try and edit a repeating event, it pops up this really helpful one. And this is helpful for a number of reasons. It actually mitigates the issue. It tells you what will help and it will tell you how to do it. Or in this case, it will actually do it for you. And that's good. That's exactly what an alert should be. You have to. Has anyone been seriously annoyed by this alert? No, exactly. You're wasting the user's time unless you make your alerts like this or don't use them at all. More importantly with alerts, don't cry wolf. Don't waste their time, just don't waste their time. There are some suitable alerts if you absolutely must use alerts beyond the sort of really helpful ones. Is this not gonna work? So if something critically wrong has happened, you tell them, and alert's an okay way of doing that. Uh, if you need permission, so I need permission to scan your Facebook friends and sell all your details, yes or no, that's a decent alert. And help please, I need your password so I can scan all your Facebook friends and sell all your details, that's also acceptable. Unsuitable alerts include everything else. So I, I'm guilty of some of these in apps that I've worked on. Don't do any of these things. Especially the App Store review one. It does actually work for reviews go, but it's, it's just wasting the user's time as far as the actual app goes. So just balance those things. Uh, this part of the talk is basically me jumping between random hints that help avoid mistakes and failures. So we're gonna talk about flow first, very briefly. If your app has a complex flow or a stranger than average flow, give hints. Hint, hint what they need to click, hint where they need to go next. Be subtle and make sure they don't actually have to read a manual to use your app. Always hint there's more if there is, and always show rather than tell. And by that I mean, think of like iMovie on the new iPhone 4. It's got a bunch of filters and things you can apply to your, your video. It doesn't actually just say this is a filter that does this, it just shows you a bunch of little previews. You don't even have to think about it, you just tap the button you want, you want it to look like. That's showing rather than telling. You should always do that. Another thing that leads to huge failures is icon consistency. Apple provides a fairly large amount of built-in icons on both Mac OS X and iOS. And we know them to do certain things. And often people use those icons to mean something completely different. Um, they can lead to pretty huge failures on behalf of your users. And in worst cases on the iOS store, because Apple reviews everything, then you can actually get rejected because you tell them wrong. When you're designing for iOS, don't forget fingers. Fingers are big and imprecise. Uh, fingers need breathing room, so check Apple's HIG for like the hit size, which is I think it's 44 by 44, and obey that pretty rigidly because otherwise you're gonna have user mashing the screen and they're gonna hit things that they don't mean to hit, and then that's your fault. 
an autocorrect. The iPhone's pretty great at it. Uh, but it's often turned on where it shouldn't be, like in password fields, um, which is just like an instant failure where you can't actually input your password because iOS tries to, like, you've got some weird password and iOS tries to turn it into, like, Herman all the time or something similar, which happens to me. I should probably figure out my password from that, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, along the same line, use the right keyboard. Um, iOS has a bunch of cool keyboards, and they all do different things. And often people just leave the default one on, which has got a return button. But you can actually put like search buttons and OK buttons and all manner of junk in the corner. And in the later versions of iOS, you can even write your own custom keyboard entirely. People don't do that. They just leave the return button. It's confusing. You may as well use these keyboards. They're there. They're free. It's just a tick box and interface builder on the input field. Do it. Back to the finger thing, the touch screen really is out to get you. It's, it's big and imprecise and, and useless. So make sure you've carefully designed and thought about the touch targets. Uh, watch what your users do and make sure you know what they're doing in testing and then you can fix problems before they actually occur in the public. And don't forget undo. Quite simply, if you cannot undo, you have failed. Completely failed. Your app is crap. And I've said this to people before and they go something like that. It's like, I, I don't want to do undo. My app, my app is complex. It talks to the network. It uses a really complex file structure, whatever. Uh, no, that, that's not an excuse. If you cannot undo, you failed, completely failed. Uh, so please just don't complain and actually do it. Uh, undo can be really, really simple. And Coco makes that pretty easy to some extent, or it can be really complex. You should have undo, because undo sort of means any sort of mistake can be erased by the user, especially if the accessing the undo is easy. Uh, give you a good example of undo. It's Gmail. So I've sent a message that you suck to somebody. There's an undo button. I click undo, takes me back here. Sending has been undone. And that's obviously not really undoing anything in, in terms of what the actual app is doing. It's complete trickery. Gmail clearly did not actually send that message until I clicked undo. So use trickery if you have to, as long as you can actually undo things. Defensive design sort of covers that whole thing as a nutshell. Uh, a few more tips about the touchscreen. Tell the user what's being touched. It's not like a mouse where there's a cursor that's actually telling you what's being hovered over. And even then, you should tell them what they've clicked. But on the touchscreen, use some sort of subtle visual feedback or even uh, audio feedback. They've actually pushed something. It's pretty important. Likewise, remember consistency of expectation. Uh, if people expect a certain gesture, they get used to it and they'll try it in your app. Uh, something good like that is the, the Tweety pull down to refresh or Twitter on Twitter for iPhone. That's a really natural gesture, and people now expect that. How, how many of you wish you could sort of do that in mail or similar? Yeah, good. Okay. So people are getting used to that now, and that's the sort of thing you should be looking for. And the way to think of that is pave the cow paths, which is basically test your app when it's ready. And then if people start doing gestures you didn't anticipate in, in sort of any large volume, implement those gestures for them because the other people are going to try it. R rotation is also a huge place for fail. Often people have two completely different interfaces in landscape and portrait. They're both usually great, but you sometimes lose functionality either way. Now, there's some great usability studies, particularly sort of like Nielsen and those sort of organizations that tell you how people use iPhones and iPads. And it turns out that older people are more likely to hold it in portrait the whole time because they're thinking of it literally as a phone and they'll never turn it around. So if you're hiding functionality in landscape, you're losing functionality for a lot of users. Uh, likewise, younger people are more likely to try and turn it on its side because they like the bigger keyboard. In conclusion, a few points. Make your users feel bulletproof. If they feel bulletproof, they feel confident in your app, they know how they're going to use it, they're going to tell their friends about it, and they're not going to make as many mistakes. It's pretty simple. And there's a good way to grade apps. If your app works, it gets one star. If it's useful, it gets two. If it's pretty, it gets three. If it's easy to use, it gets four. That's where most people stop. If it's easy to use and hard to misuse, it gets five stars. And most people stop at four. That's really sad, because the last bit's actually quite easy compared to all the hard stuff of making this pretty interface to begin with. So please don't just promote understanding. Uh, prevent misunderstanding. Uh, Mistakes actually only happen because we let them. And if you don't let them happen, then there's no mistakes to happen, and your user will be happier. And sadly, developers often focus solely on the correct use case of their app. They only test the precise actual flow. And if they actually test, which is another matter entirely, but if they test, the test workflow is usually testing the functionality of the app, not testing trying to do something that's not actually in the functionality. So quality really begins with resilience to error. If you pay attention to that, then you'll have a really first-class app. And if you can't prevent that error, then just remove the risk entirely. 
and that's not as hard as it sounds, especially if you implement pervasive undo. That's everything. So if anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Uh, yeah. If anyone wants a job, also. <laughs> Thank you.